all right so this this is now if you didn't come up exactly with the same that I have that's fine but yellow was kind of the accusation green was the defensive response light blue is the evidence against them the dark blue is the um, uh, promises of God and then occasionally you had these sections in red where there would be these judgments and it would just go on and on uh, and now this commandment is for you O priest if you do not listen if you do not take it to heart to give me uh, give honor to my name says the Lord then he's gonna send this judgment upon them but he comes back and he says you know what I've got a promise I'm gonna fulfill my promise my covenant is with him, one of life and peace. And uh, the lips of the priest is to preserve knowledge. Men should seek instruction from his mouth, for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. But as for you, you have turned aside from my way. And then comes the judgment. So throughout the book of Malachi, you have this, these kinds of cycles where um, God is accusing them, they're being defensive, and uh, then God comes back. And with every judgment, there is a promise. You know, if I'm going to judge you, I'm going to bless somebody else. And I will raise somebody else up. So questions about the Malachi assignment. Now, uh, yeah, questions about the Malachi assignment that someone might have. I have a question. Yes. You're not us to have that whole no, no. No, you, the coloring is for my illustration. You're not going to have any coloring. No, no, no. But you talked about the hope of the promises of God. That wasn't part of the, uh, the request. No. I want to make sure. No, you just had to do what you had to do. All right. okay. So I'm just adding a little bit of, I'm trying to earn my money tonight, even though I'm a volunteer. So, so. my main concern is that you see these patterns in the prophets so that you that you see them as prosecuting attorneys yes Chris okay so I, I'm not actually asking about the assignment right for Malachi itself yeah um, when you say that the I, I guess we'll, we'll just say for short the Jews had uh -huh. a response but wasn't that more like a rhetorical question that was raised and is it Malachi who's actually speaking Yes, okay. it's Malachi speaking on behalf of God, confronting the people, right. and giving the typical response of the people. Okay, So I, this, this is the typical response, probably, as Malachi went around preaching God's charge, uh, this was probably the typical response that he got from people. So, you know, it, it's like I, I was talking with somebody recently about, you know, there's so much cash stuff going on in the economy, you know, and it's really easy to say, nah, I'm not going to declare that, you know, before the government or whatever, but we're supposed to. But then people come back and say, but, you know, all the government wastes the money and they use it for bad programs and they use it for you know, and uh, ungodly things, so on and so forth. But you see, that doesn't justify what we're supposed to have in the sense of integrity, uh, you know, within the system. So, or, or you know, you, you just, we, we've all heard people give, you know, terrible uh, reasons for not doing what is right. So, you know. Other questions about the assignment, this particular assignment. So that that's that's the main goal of this assignment. Does how, how many understand the prophets as prosecuting attorneys? Let me see their hands. All right. How many saw the defensive reaction of the people making up excuses? Oh, revival's breaking out. How many uh, saw that God always provided uh, some hope, some promise that he was going to fulfill? And, and how many saw that God was pretty firm about his judgment? He was going to nail him. All right. Very good. 
Now, Dr. John, I have a question. Yes. How do you feel uh, God deals with judgment now today on people? I, you know, Galatians tells us that we reap what we sow. Mm -hmm. That one of the most severe judgments of God is when he gives somebody over to the depravity of their lusts. So the judgment of God in some ways is slower, it lasts longer, but, but even for these, these generations, I mean, they, they built up 20, 30, 40 years of rebellion and sin against God before the hammer came down on the whole nation. So, um, you know, be not deceived. God will not be mocked or made a fool of. Whatever a person sows, that they shall also reap. And a lot of people sow oats in their youth and then pray for a crop failure, right? <laughs> but it doesn't happen. Um, the one that sows to the Spirit, will the Spirit reap everlasting life? The one that sows to the flesh, will the flesh reap corruption? Beth? A little louder, so I can hear. If this is something a little too far off base, I'll try and get with you later. But uh -huh. What is our approach to people we perceive are under God's judgment? Are we to show them compassion? Well, you know, again, that you got to say, are they a believer? Are they a non-believer? Um, you know, Hebrews 12 says that God chastises, and he uses the same metaphor that was used of the beating and the scourging of uh, Jesus Christ. Uh, so, you know, there is some severe chastisement out there. The Bible clearly speaks of the, the categories of people that believers are not even to sit down and have a meal with. So, um, and, you know, that's just uh, the way it is. So, um, you know, some years ago, um, I had a brother-in-law divorce my sister. Uh, he divorced her for all the wrong reasons and was uh, very guilty. Um, when uh, Thanksgiving time came, uh, he was not welcome at my home. I took a lot of flack for that, a lot of flack. Uh, when Christmas came, um, go around the, around the long way if you can, because uh, the camera's right. When Christmas came, I said, I will not be at the same place that he is. Uh, and and you've got to understand, I mean, I reached out to him. I tried to have, you know, lunch with him, breakfast with him, talk about it, you know, see if I could help work things out. Um, but it was an egregious sin, and he, and he claimed to be a believer, and I think he is probably. Uh, and I took a lot of flack for that. Um, but I think the Bible said, hey, I can't sit down and have a uh, fellowship with this guy as if nothing ever happened. Now, years later, you know, my sister and my nieces and my family came back and they said, Uncle John or Dad or whatever, you were right. Now, that didn't, that didn't help me, you know. Uh, you know, over those years, I just knew I was doing the right thing. So, uh, I, have I answered or beat around the bush of your question enough? The most loving thing that we can do, the most loving thing a church can do, is to say, by God's grace, don't go down that sinful path. And if you do, I will not have fellowship with you. And it's got to be within those categories. So I had a guy recently, he's, you know, he told everybody, he, he divorced, he told everybody he had remarried. Uh, he had to go before a judge, and in front of the judge he couldn't lie. And he, had, and he said, no, I'm not married. Then when his close friends confronted him and said, you've been lying to us for years telling us you were married, his answer was, I can't 
afford to get married because I'd lose $300 a month in some kind of, you know, uh, federal money coming in. And, and so the Christian brothers around him said, that's it. Till you make it right, uh, we're not fellowshipping anymore. Chris? So is that what Paul meant by handing some of the brethren over to Satan? Well, um, that's a little different situation in that this man was in an egregious sin and was unrepentant. And Paul had apostolic authority. Um, but I, I do know in my years as a pastor, when I faced some egregious, unrepentant situations, I turned them over to the Lord's chastisement and to whatever his will was, because the sooner they came back, the better it was for them, the better it was for the body of Christ. But I don't try to pronounce that apostolic uh, thing. Yes? Um, but this really is not sitting well with me. Because when I, That's when okay. I think, when I think about it, when you say things like that, I mean, we all have sin and fallen short of the glory of God. Right. And really, to me, that's kind of passing judgment on someone or even... No, no. And, I mean, still in that, it even... Paul gives us categories. Categories of sinners. There is, I mean, there is so, but still, can you ever say in your life you never did that? No, I, I have not. Uh, I'll say this. In the categories of which Paul talks about, in which he says, if you call yourself a brother or a sister in Christ, mm -hmm. and your life is characterized by one of these categories, mm -hmm. that people are to shun you and not have fellowship with you. Mm -hmm. I tell my, when I was a pastor, I told my congregation, and I tell you as my students, mm -hmm. if you ever see me stepping on the pathway of sin. If you ever see me compromise and enter into one of those lifestyles, you grab me, you hug me, you love me, and you tell me, stop it. And you do not let me go. And if I forsake it and I say, get away from me, then you shun me and you pray for me and you pray God's judgment on me because the sooner you do it, the sooner I repent, the sooner I come back. Amen. So it's only within those categories. You know, I'll, I'll get to you. In Galatians, it says, you who are spiritual, restore such a one who has been in a spirit of humility, who has been caught, caught off guard, it could be, or actually caught. And so I, I do agree, there has to be a great compassion of, of restoration and reaching out. But when a person violates these categories, then we as a, as a body have to do that. I'll give you one more illustration, then I'll uh, listen to Ed. Uh, I was at a very large church years ago, and there was a prominent couple in the church that entered into divorce and both were in immoral relationships. I was not on pastoral staff, I was president of a seminary. But when I was consulted, I said to the leadership, if you do not take a strong stand here and isolate these people, you're going to have a domino effect. They chose not to. Within one year, six couples that were personal friends of theirs all fell into the same problems because they knew there was no consequences. So, go ahead. Uh, it, it, Ed? The question is twofold. Yeah. What if that person that is experiencing egregious sin is your literal brother, your, sister, your sibling, You're right. or your son, or your daughter? Right. Well, uh, I, I, the, the scriptures to me say that whoever, now they have to be declaring themselves to be believers. They have to say, I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. Right. We're not talking about non-believers at all. Right. But, you know, if it's my brother, uh, you know, I've done it. Uh, my children, 
I have told my children, you know, that there's a, there's a rule in the Bible. Believers have to marry who? Believers. Believers. I've told them years ago, Dad will not be at your wedding if you violate that principle. You know? And now, that doesn't mean I don't love them. It doesn't mean... But if, if they're into one of those egregious things, I'm trusting God's word to bring them back. And, I, and I'll tell you, beloved, I have, I have been there, done that, and lived it as a pastor, as a community leader, and I've seen it work. I've seen it work. I've seen people come back from the most desperate places and situations. I've seen them come back. I've seen God's word work. But yeah, you know, I'm, I'm cordial. I'm, you know, so, yes. Where is that found? Where Paul is the category? And First Corinthians. So I'd have to look it up. So, yes. Yeah, brother in Christ. Yes. Yes. Now, suppose you have some some people who were already married and you didn't know about and they, and they come to your ministry. Right. You know, um, and they experience difficulties and you begin to um, talk about it and you begin to find out. Uh -huh. You find out that the divorce was... Right. Well, wrong. right. And let me, just, let me just say this. I have a basic assumption. All marriages have problems. <laughs> All right? <laughs> Ozzy and Harriet died years ago. <laughs> no, what I'm talking about, yes. when, you, when you begin to yes. uh, find out some history about sure, the lives, Sure, sure. Right. You began to find out about each one of them. Both of them had been divorced. Oh yeah. One was in the wrong. One was in. What What do you do with that? Well, we'll we're, we'll get into the whole you know divorce thing after. I I can't unravel the past. I don't go and try to judge the past, and all of those kinds of things. That's between other people and their God, their Lord. Uh, I don't make myself a judge except in the spheres for which I have responsibility. So, uh, Chessie? I was trying to look for the verse, but I have to say it off the, like the paraphrase. Um, when it says in the New Testament that if a man cannot feed his family, he mm -hmm. to just believe it, that to be taken literally... Yeah, Matthew 18. Okay. And other places. Yeah, yes. pardon me? Is that verse, any verse that's like that? Yeah. To be taken literally or figuratively. And that he's be treated like a tax collector, like a tax collector, or he's worse than disbelief. Yeah, yeah. Well, no, I think it's taken literally. I mean, it's it, it's again the idea of it's, it's somebody that you're just not going to um, have fellowship with, you know. And, and fellowship is a communion kind of thing. It's a friendship kind of thing, you know. I mean, it doesn't mean that if I'm walking through the store and I happen to see somebody that I'm not cordial uh, with them. But remember, in, in ancient Near Eastern history, to invite somebody into your home to have a meal with them was an absolute statement of acceptance uh, of that person. Rod? Okay, now, this, this is a true story. I know someone who, was a, who is a believer. They were married to a believer. That individual committed adultery. Uh huh. They received a divorce. Right. Then they remarried another believer. Right. Now my question is, what is well, well, I'm going to sort that all out when we do the, the, the <laughs> that one. We're going to save that one for the for the separate. We're going to finish up the the uh, Matthew passage and then take a break and then we're going to cover or take on divorce in a longer uh, time frame. So believe me. I, I have sat down and uh, and I I couldn't find it in my computer, but I have a flow chart, believe it or not, <laughs> that follows all the possibilities. I have a copy of it. Of, do you, yeah, yeah I, I've got one here uh, and a flow chart that goes through all the different you know uh, possibilities and as it goes down as I've tried to you know figure it out. So yes, all right. Uh, well, let's take a look at the Matthew one. All right. Uh, yes. 
All right, because this is, this is not, I don't think, a particularly complicated one. The main goal in this one was that we would look at how the New Testament uses the Old Testament. And so what we want to do is we want to understand that when they quoted a verse, they were quoting a verse in a greater context. And so anytime you have a quote in the New Testament, you need to go back to the Old Testament, where from the New Testament to the Old Testament, and then you need to read the broader, bigger context to get what we would call the rest of the story. So in Matthew 4, we see that Jesus quotes and says, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Right? Mm -hmm. And this takes us back to Deuteronomy chapter 8. Right? Mm -hmm. And in Deuteronomy chapter 8, what, what is going on in Deuteronomy chapter 8? So, Peter, go ahead nice and loud. They were... Um coming out of the wilderness and about to go into the promised land. Um, and God was testing them. Uh, yes. He was testing their hearts to see if they would, um, if they would uh, comply with his commandments and also um, reminded them of who provided um, them with their needs throughout the um, 40 years. Yes. And were they, did they pass the test or fail the test? They failed the test. And, and what we need to understand is that, and this is particularly true from like Isaiah chapter 52 and 53, Israel was seen as the son of God in a corporate sense. They were seen as the servant of God and the son of God. Behold, my servant will prosper. He will be high and lifted up and greatly exalted, just as many were astonished at you, my people. So his appearance was marred. Everything that we see in Isaiah 53 uh, Jewish people today would say, well, Israel was the son, that there is no literal son to come. But you see throughout the Old Testament that there is this uh, family, sonship, servantship kind of metaphor that is used of the nation of Israel. And the nation of Israel failed as the son. They failed all of the tests. So this is why we see that Jesus as the Messiah is coming along and he is uh, fulfilling these. He is the obedient servant. Then the next one. Then the devil took him into the holy city and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, or since you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands... They will bear you up so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. So Jesus quotes scripture to the, to the devil to defeat him or to turn him back. So now the devil's going to use the scriptures to try to trip him up. And Jesus said to him, on the other hand, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And where does this come from? Pardon me? From, from both Deuteronomy uh, as well as the psalm. The psalmist refers back to Deuteronomy also. And uh, what is going on in Deuteronomy 6 that uh, is, gives us the historical background? Pardon me? Chris? They were testing God at Massa. Yes. And what was that test that they were going through? at Massa. Yeah, the, the water. Would God provide for them? You know? You just provided food and now they need water and they yeah. can't believe you. And, and what have you done for me yeah. in the last couple hours? You know? And so, uh, of course, 
you know, it's, it's uh, the historical context again, of which Jesus, they failed, but Jesus will, uh, will survive. The third one uh, is uh, from what passage? Deuteronomy 6.15. Deuteronomy 6.15. Yes. Oh, here it is. And then the devil took him up to a very high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. Who knows? Could have been the same mountain that Moses was on. Uh, then Jesus said to him, Go, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. So this is from Deuteronomy 6.15. And what was their failure there? They worship idol gods. They were worshiping idol gods. Yes. The bales and and just uh, you know they they got tripped up so often by and, and what we need to remember is in the backdrop of all of these gods were the promises of fertility the promises of rain the promises of a harvest you know the promises of all of these things if you ever get it if you ever take a trip to Chicago one of the best museums in the Midwest is at the University of Chicago, the uh, Oriental uh, Institute. And you can go in there, I think it's fairly cheap, and you can walk around and see tremendous artifacts from ancient Near Eastern history, the fertility gods, the Baal, the Ashtaroth, the Ashtardi, and all of these. And just seeing them, you know, tells you the story of how at the base of their idolatry was greed. Was greed. They wanted to manipulate the gods, do whatever they had to, to get prosperity, to get the rain, to get the, you know, the fertility, not just for their wife, but for their goats, for their sheep, for their cattle. Uh, that's why so many of these um, uh, idols were in the shapes of uh, various animals. Yes, yes. The temptations were referring back to these passages in Deuteronomy, but this is referring back to when they actually failed in Exodus. Absolutely. And Deuteronomy goes back to the failure of Exodus. When, just uh, like, this is just like a reminder, right? Like a refresher, like don't do this again. Right. Absolutely. At learn from the past. Learn from the failures. Peter? I also um, have um, Deuteronomy 10.20. That. And what does it say? Yes, it's a it's a repeat. Yeah, and any time uh, scripture repeats something, uh, it's for extra importance. Uh, you shall fear the Lord your God. You shall serve Him and cling to Him, and you shall swear by His name. Uh, idolatry substituting God is just one of the great fra frail frailties of humanity. Uh, idolatry and immorality always go hand in hand because if you forsake your God, you will forsake your covenant relationships to you know, all uh, kinds of other people. So, other questions? Dr. John. Yes. In um, Deuteronomy 9, 18. Uh-huh. Said, then once again I fell prostrate before the Lord for 40 days and 40 nights. And then we have that repeated in Matthew 40 days and 40 yes. nights. Is there significance there? No, well, it's, it's, um, there is a type and anti type. Jesus is the fulfillment of Moses, and that is explicitly uh, mentioned in the New Testament. Uh, Jesus is superior to and supersedes Moses. Yes. Yes, Peter. Would it be um, fair to say that Jesus represented, in some way, Israel while in the desert? Yes, absolutely. There's definite parallels there, um, as Jesus is in in the wilderness. So, yes. What was the significance of this being done before he started his mission? Um, I don't know if the text tells us the significance other than it is the continuation of Satan's warfare 
against the Messiah. And the warfare began where? In Genesis. And then where did it begin in the life of Jesus? Yes, but particularly when Herod destroys the children, hoping to destroy the Christ child. And so that you see that enmity between you and him throughout. And uh, uh, this was the full testing of the humanity of, uh, of Jesus. And remember, Jesus is the only one who has fully endured the intensity and onslaught of sin. I'm, so, I'm sorry, of temptation, without sin. Because remember, as soon as we give in to temptation, we've cut off, we've ended the stress of it all. And uh, so some people say, oh, he wasn't, he wasn't tempted as bad as you know we are. Uh, you know, the longer you hold out, the, the greater the temptation. So, you know, let me go four hours and tell me I got to drive by a buffet and I'm upset. <laughs> 40 days and 40 nights. And, uh, and, you know, it was the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. It was all of the same, you know, categories. So, Chris? Can you say that Jesus fulfilled what was told in James 1.13, where God cannot be tempted by evil? Ah, that's a good passage. See, that's a bad translation. The better translation is God is untemptable. And I'll explain that. So, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil. Now, the word is not cannot be tempted as much, because you notice the cannot is not there, down here in the Greek. It's better translated, God is untemptable by evil. That's different. In other words, the very nature of who God is means he's untemptable. <coughs> Uh, best illustration I can give you is uh, years ago when I was pastoring out in Chelsea, there's the Chrysler Proving Grounds out there, and, and the Chrysler Proving Grounds was the proving grounds for General Dynamics and all of their tanks. And they had a huge area in the back that was the testing uh, platform for the tanks. I mean, you know, ponds of mud, big hills to go over trees to crush down. They would take it out there. They would shoot all kinds of stuff at it. And basically what General Dynamics said is, under these conditions, this weaponry is indestructible. You can try to destroy it, but it is indestructible. So you can try to tempt God, but God is untemptable by evil. Does that explain it? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, but it wasn't his divinity, it was his humanity that was the correct? Right? Absolutely. Absolutely. But uh, he was, uh, the Philippians says he was made like us. But what was different? He had no indwelling sin. He had no sin nature. Uh, he could say, you have nothing in me. So, but he, he, did, he did endure the temptation. And, and again, you know, people talk about, well, you know, Jesus doesn't understand my problems. Look, Joseph probably died shortly, you know, somewhere between 13 and 30 because he's not on the scene anymore. The last time we see Joseph is at his bar mitzvah, Jesus' bar mitzvah. By the time you get to Jesus going about, Joseph is gone. The only explanation is Joseph is dead. Somewhere along the line there, Joseph dies, and Jesus becomes the head of the family and has to raise all those, help raise all those kids, take care of his mother, work the carpenter shop, so on and so forth. And then, you know, as you read the Gospels, all, all those brothers were like snot-nosed, you know, calling them crazy, trying to drag them away, say he was insane. I mean, he, know, he knew what it was like to try to get along with family, you know, and bad family at that. 
So the most important lesson, hermeneutical lesson, out of this is when you see a passage quoted in the New Testament from the Old Testament, you've got to stop, you've got to go back, you've got to open up your Old Testament, you've got to see the big picture of it all. And, uh, you know, uh, the book of Romans is just right with all of these quotes from the Old Testament. But until you go back and you see the big picture, you know, when David, quote, when David talks about forgiveness, you know, you got to go back and understand he's talking about the whole David and Bathsheba and Uriah, you know, the whole thing. And uh, so, uh, got to see the whole picture. Yes, Beth? I'm aware of this, but I don't understand the reasoning of Christians who say we don't need the Old Testament. Or that it's not relevant. Yeah, you know, some some people are, uh, you know, and we'll learn about this more in theology, but are so ultra dispensationalists. In other words, the only the New Testament is for us, and some of them say only the epistles are for us, and and some of them just don't want to take the extra work it is for the Old Testament. But Romans fifteen four, whatever I think it's fifteen four. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through the endurance, uh, through endurance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. The whole, whole Old Testament is just filled with hope and encouragement. You know, who God saw Abraham through Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. He saw the children of Israel through Rahab and Abraham. He saw, you know, Job, he, you know, on and on and on. So... Uh, the, the, the most crushing experience in my entire life, it was the Psalms that, uh, you know, brought me, uh, brought me through it. Uh, the, the empathy of the Psalms, the compassion of the Psalms. Uh, you know, I, I didn't let myself dwell on those imprecatory, imprecatory Psalms of judgment very much. You know, those are the ones where you call down God's judgment on your enemies. You just leave that as alone, but um, yeah, the Old Testament is. Uh, I don't. I don't understand people who want to, you know, take away these great stories. So, but again, we're new covenant believers, not old covenant believers. So, other comments. Tell me where you're itching, so I can scratch. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, what did he exist in? Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, he was the form of God, did not regard, what was he? Equality, Equality with God, a thing to be grasped. Now, let's, uh, let's look at this word grasped. Now, if we looked at, what's the old King James on this? The, the old King James is actually closer. Here, he did not consider it robbery. All right, now, I'm going to go to the Greek for you. Well, that's what happened. All right, we're going to do this. Did not consider robbery. Harpagmas. I'm going to right-click it. I'm going to execute a key link. That's going to take me to my Greek works. Harpagman, a violent seizure of property or robbery to claim to which one claims or asserts title by gripping or grasping self-claimed you see down here booty what what is booty spoils, spoils. spoils. yeah I, don't, I mean the ancient booty not the, <laughs> not the colloquial booty so now when it says jesus did not consider his equality with God, something to be booty, something to be grass, something to be abused or misused. Harpagman is used very often in military contexts of soldiers entering the city and plundering and abusing and misusing the people. And what Philippians teaches us that when Jesus was on earth, he did not use his deity, his equality with God, in any kind of a selfish, um, 
uh, uh, abusive or um, uh, uh, I, I just grasp for what words in English might communicate this. Um, he didn't abuse it or misuse it because he was underneath the, the Lord's authority. For, so for him to have said, all right, I'm going to change that rock to bread and feed myself would have been to abuse and misuse his divine power, which God said you can't use without my permission. Chris? Okay, two things. Yes. One, it said, I, I believe in the Proverbs, how he didn't take on the nature, or not Proverbs, but Psalms, the nature of angels. Uh-huh. Um, so it, does that kind of describe why he didn't use that? And then also, if he was to enact what Satan was proposing, wouldn't that show obedience to Satan? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, that, that he was following Satan versus... Everything he did, he could only do by the permission of the will of the Father. So, Chessie and then Clarence. Okay, Clarence. Yes, sir. I think that you spoke of his, what was that word to use? His, the power that he had that he never used? Yes. My, my mind goes back to when they were trying to arrest him. And the yes. guard snatched the ear yeah. and he told him, don't you know what I have at my exposure? Yeah, yeah, and absolutely. To use that. Yeah, yeah. Could have called 10,000 angels. Yes, Put your sword away. Yes, sir. You know, and, and even in, in front of Satan, or in front of uh, Pontius Pilate, you know. So, yes. Very good questions. Yes. And the situation at Meribah, where Aaron and Moses disobeyed, is it proper to make a correlation between the rocks spewing out the water, and it was supposed to have done that freely without man's interference, and and without Christ, his anger? Uh huh. Yeah. And Christ on the cross, and his death had to precede the coming of the Holy Spirit, and that He gave His life willingly. Well, see, I don't. See, you don't have a direct link right. there. So then, it's uh, unless it's a, a unless it's a scriptural link. I leave my imagination alone. Because my mind went there because sure. it started out in Matthew and it took us back to the passage about Meribah. Right, so trying right. to make that connection, I thought, well... Yeah, but, uh, but the Matthew passage isn't about the cross. Okay. So, right. So I try to limit it because, you see, um, you could... You could the, unless there's a scriptural link, the imagination can make all kinds of links that at times can go uh, go which way? Awry. Awry, yes. Awry is a good word. So, All right. So, well, I think we're learning. I think we have a sense of that. So, yeah, I'll get it. So, uh, let's take a break.